All right. Uh, so we're going to we're going to continue on our series. Um, I saw a sign. No, you didn't. We're going to take a look at the purpose of signs. Um, just kind of remind ourselves what what are the two main reasons for signs? Hang on, hang on. Um, well, that's that's part of it. Oh, so yeah. validate the validate message. The messenger and the sign Validate the messenger, and it has to be consistent with what God's doing, right? So, and the Jews require a sign. In fact, we find out that um, it's not for believers, but for unbelievers, unbelievers right? Unbelieving so it's for unbelieving Israel to show them. We talked about that, and we'll take a look so at that a little bit more. Well, yeah, and we're not shocked about that, unfortunately, right? Um, there's a lot in Christianity that is backwards right and so that's some of the things that we want to make sure that we keep in mind as we go through there all right um <clears throat> so let me go ahead we'll get started on the recording there um so like i said we're going to continue on on this series and there's a few things that i want to make sure that we keep in mind as we go through this so what i want us to do today is let's go back to daniel all right so we're going to start off in daniel chapter 9 and then we're going to pick up on some things and make sure that we understand uh, what's going on. Now, what's interesting is uh, if you go back to Leviticus chapter 26, all right, and I, I, I actually thought about doing this, but uh, just for time's sake, um, we won't for right now. But if you go back to, to, to Leviticus 26, there are five courses of chastisement all right um, and it's for the nation of Israel all right so there's there's five courses of chastisement and in the fifth course uh, in that fifth course there's actually um, five different parts there as well all right all right so there's five parts within that fifth course of judgment now, what's happening is you get down, when we get over to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are, the nation of Israel is in that fifth course of chastisement. And what we find out is the first, second, third, and fourth, um, we've talked about this before, and you know, without reading all this stuff, I just want to make sure that we, we understand these. Um, and this is something that, you know, we, we probably should know anyway. Uh, that first course of chastisement, um, whatever's taking place there, which ends up being like physical sickness, right? Um, then the second course of chastisement comes on, and it's added to all the problems that they had from the first chastisement, right? In fact, you go back there and you find out it's seven times more than what was before uh, that's added on to it. And then the third is added on to the first and second together. And then the fourth is added on to all four of those. And then the fifth is added to all those before. So it's not like here's this one thing. Once you're done with it, you move on to the next one. Once you're done with that one, you move on to the third one. It's all these things are going on at the exact same time. All right. And we've, if you remember, we've talked about Israel's sin sickness. Right, we've talked about that uh, throughout the time. And so during this fifth course, there's five parts to that one. During that fifth course, that's what Daniel's talking about here in Daniel chapter 9. Right? So that's part of it, what's going on. Notice here in Daniel chapter 9, let's start off in verse 24. All right? this, is, this is one of those things that a lot of people... Uh, today, unfortunately, have absolutely no idea what's going on here. And then you can preach people into fear, um, preach people into distress and, and shame and, and rejection and all kinds of different things like that, which is what religion's all about, right? But notice, <clears throat> Math, or Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. And the reason I bring this up is so that we know that when we see Christ him living his life, the nation of Israel is to know that that, that fifth course of chastisement is going on 
and everything is going according to plan. Everything's on time, right? Notice here in, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, right? So during this, during this fifth course, there's going to be 70 weeks, right? Who's it determined upon, by the way? Thy people. Who's Daniel's people? The nation of Israel. Clear as day, right? Um, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. What's the holy city? Israel. It's Jerusalem, right? Uh, and then there's six things why these 70 weeks are determined upon them. Notice, to finish the transgression, number two, and to make an end of sins, number three, and to make, all, uh, to make reconciliation for iniquity, Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. And six is to anoint the most holy. All right, so those are the six things that is why these 70 weeks are determined upon thy people is to fulfill uh, these six things. <clears throat> Notice in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that, the go that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall say, Come, shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the world the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. As we take a look at this important information, may we keep in mind where we are and how these things are going to be fulfilled. And uh, we know exactly how it's going to be fulfilled and that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope that we can study these things and know that you are faithful to your word and the things that you have promised us. You will also do for us, and we thank you in Christ's name. It's in, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, that's a real quick overview of the 70th weeks. All right, the 70 weeks. Now, here's what's going to take place. Notice he says, verse 25, For uh, know therefore and understand, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. All right? So you got to think about this. <clears throat> he splits up that, those 70 weeks as seven weeks, right? Uh, notice he says, uh, under the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Well, what's three score? Well, what's score? 20, 20 right? So three score would be 60. And he says three score and two weeks, which would be what? 62 weeks. No, there's, there's, there's other parts to that, but the majority of it is the 70 weeks, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> all right. So then, what happens? Notice, let's keep on reading. Uh, so from the going forth of commandment, there's going to be seven weeks and then 62 weeks. And notice, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So what's going to take place at the end, after that 62nd week is what? Crucifixion of Christ, Okay. So at the end of the 62 weeks, notice he says in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Okay, what's that mean to be cut off? Well, you go over to Isaiah 53 and you find out it's him being crucified. Okay, so how many weeks do we have there? Seven and 62 is what? I know it's, I know it's still early and math is 71. seven and 62. You're fine. 69. 69, right? So there's 70 weeks total. There's 69 here. So that leaves how many weeks left is one week, right? Now what's going to happen during that one week? Notice verse 27. And he, who's the he? He's the prince, the people of the prince shall come. 
All right, the prince that he's talking about there is going to be the Antichrist. Notice in verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's that 70th week. Okay. Now, what I want us to think about is, during this time period, uh, a, lot of times, a lot of times we think about, you know, why is it split up? 7 and 62 and then 1. Well, I think the 1 is pretty obvious. Uh, the 7 and the 62 might not be as obvious, but what I want us to think about is during this time period here, during that time period there, there's silence. God stops talking to the nation of Israel as a whole. We think of that as the time period between, in our Bible, Malachi to Matthew, right? Right? And that's normally what we think of during that time period. But here's, here's some things that's taking place. What's going on is there's, there's some things that's going to have to take place before his death. Of course, he has to be what? He has to live. He has to be born. And before that, there has to be what? A forerunner, right? That's where we find ourselves. Go over to Matthew chapter 3. Now, again, like I said, I just wanted us to have this in our mind to get us to where we're going. Would the average Israelite know about the five courses of chastisement and the 70 weeks of Daniel? They should. All right? So when things start happening, they should look and say, hey, that's this verse being fulfilled. Okay? Huh? No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, they should have, but they didn't, right? So, notice here, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. By the way, what is it that... John the Baptist does to prove his ministry. Well, he yeah, but what's he what's he do here? What's he say? Huh? So he's quoting the scripture, right? He's saying, I'm the one here to prepare the way for the Lord because this is the verse being fulfilled right now today. He is. Yeah, he is. That's what he's saying, right? In verse 2, he says, uh, and, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment go on down through there. So they would have known if this guy shows up doing what Isaiah said. Doing what Isaiah said what should we know is going to happen? The Messiah is coming. They should know that. Why? Because they know their own history. They should know this. Right? Now, we get over to chapter 4. And, and, and again, we start seeing these things, right? Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus Christ, this is after His... His baptism, this is after he goes up into the mountain is, and is tempted of, of Satan three different times. We get over here at the end of that. He comes down and notice he goes up into Galilee in verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist shows up. He says what? Repent. Why? The kingdom is at hand, right? Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus Christ is preaching the exact same message, is he not? The exact same thing. Go over to Matthew chapter 10. Now, we learn a little bit more about what this gospel has to do with, right? Matthew chapter 10. Jesus Christ calls out his 12. And in verse 7. Now, we could spend time on verse 5 and verse 6. We know that, right? We know, he says, don't go in the way of the Gentiles, but in, in the cities of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house. We know that, right? 
Notice in verse 7, And as ye go, preach, saying, what? The kingdom of heaven is what? The exact same thing that John the Baptist and Jesus Christ himself started preaching, right? Notice this. <clears throat> what is it that goes along with this preaching the kingdom of heaven is in hand? Verse 7. And as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand, notice what? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have you received, freely give. What's he say? Go heal and cast out devils. Do you all remember when we first started this, we talked about the... the the signs that God gave Moses to say when you show up and they don't believe that I've sent you, there's three things that I want you to do, right? One is what? Healing. Well, the first one was the snake, right? You have control over the snake. That would be reference to casting out of the devils. Second would be what? The healing of, 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 the, of the leprosy. The third one was there's judgment coming, right? So we, we know that. And we, we've, we've looked at how that shows up in Christ's ministry. Okay, Notice, what's he doing here? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Right? So what's he doing? Healing the sick, casting out devils. Those are the two main things that's going on. Um, jump back to, to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4. And we'll see this again. This is, uh, this is shortly after, you know, we read verse 17 where Christ says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, here we've got, um, he's got Peter, Andrew, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. <clears throat> Notice in verse 23. Yeah, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching what? Gospel of the kingdom. That the kingdom is what? At hand. Notice, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now I want you to stop there for just a second. You've got a pen in your Bible, underline where it says healing all manner of sickness. How much? Did he miss one? No. And all manner of disease. Did he miss one? No. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments. Notice, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he what? Healed them. Without discrimination, right? Did he say, you don't have enough faith, go away. You don't have enough faith, you need to give money to my ministry in order for me to heal you. Is that what he says? No. All right. So we see those things. <clears throat> um, go, over to, go over to Matthew chapter 8 real quick. Now I want you to notice something. This is this is really this is really interesting because we, we, we get to see we get to see something. In fact, uh, Matthew chapter eight. Go back. Uh, well, let's do this. Hold your place there. Go to go to Psalm eighty nine. So Psalm eighty nine and Psalm one hundred seven. Because this is this is really interesting to me. Um, and you know, it's easy, it's easy on this side of things to say, yeah, how could you not see this? Am I right? Yeah. But, you know, how often, how often do we, do we read, for instance, the fact that we're dead to sin in Romans chapter 6, and yet we still don't believe it sometimes and go and do whatever, right? I mean, that's... That's something, we, you know, it's easy to say, Israel, how did you not get this? Notice in Psalm 89, notice Psalm 89, verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Notice, 
O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? It's a good question, right? Who is a strong Lord like unto him? No one. Or to thy faithfulness around about thee? Notice, who, who is it that the psalmist is talking about here? God. Notice he says, the Lord God. Who's the Lord God of hosts? He's talking about Jehovah here, right? Notice, verse 9, Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, what happens? Who stills the waves? Jehovah, right? The Lord God of hosts. Go over to Psalm 107. Now you all probably know exactly where we're going to go with this, but notice in Psalm 107. Um, let's start here in verse... There's a whole bunch of good stuff here. Verse 21. Oh that, would, oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare His works with rejoicing. That they go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. For He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro, stagger like drunken men, and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He bringeth them out of their distresses. Notice, He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. <coughs> so who are they talking about here? Who is it? It's the Lord, right? It's Jehovah. What's he do to the storm? Calms it. What's he do to the waves? Makes them still. Who's the one that does that? Jehovah. Matthew chapter 8. Again, we can look at this and say, Israel, how do you not get this? And that's exactly where we're going. Notice Matthew chapter 8. Verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, and disciples, uh, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves... But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, By the way, just think about this. You're on a ship. It's being tossed to and fro. It's got all these waves. They're, they're covered up by the waves. Jesus Christ is in there sleeping. They had to go wake him up. Notice, and his disciples, verse 25, came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Question, who is the person that is able to calm the sea? Jehovah. Notice, verse 27, But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Did they recognize that they have Jehovah in their midst? Doesn't look like it. They're saying what? What manner of man is this? Now, what happens is somebody comes along and they read this passage and say, just, you know, God's going to take care of you through your life's troubles and storms and all that stuff. All you got to do is just trust in Him. Well, what's that mean to trust in Him? Why are they of men of, notice what he says, O ye of little faith. What are they 
little faith in? The Scripture that says, who's able to calm the storm? They didn't realize who He was. But it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's really interesting as you go down through here <clears throat> how, how, how oftentimes they're like, okay, you know, we're not really sure uh, what's going on, this, that, and the other. <clears throat> um, go over to Matthew chapter 14. And again, this is another one of those we, we probably know uh, where we're going to, to do this. <clears throat> but notice Matthew chapter 14. Um, verse 22, again, this is another one of those that we, we, we in hindsight can look back and say, how did you all miss it? Verse 22, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come... He was there alone. By the way, if you think of you think of a time in the evening when Christ was alone on the cross, right? Utterly. Utterly alone for three hours. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's all alone. <clears throat> Verse 24, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And, the, and in the fourth watch of the night, by the way, we talked about the fourth, fourth watch, right? Fourth watch, what's, what, this, what this really is a picture of is what? The tribulation period, what they're going to be going through. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Now, shouldn't they have known that it was possible for him to have done that? Yeah. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the water. Now, What's going to happen is you get in this tribulation period and what's going to happen is, is what is it they're going to be looking for is they're going to be looking for Christ to come, right? Verse 29, And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked in the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, Save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And he goes on down through there. Now, it's really interesting as you go through there, again, how most people present that is, well, just trust in, just trust in the Lord. Well, what does that really mean? And they have no clue, right? But when you actually understand what's going on there, what is it that he's showing the nation of Israel is what? I am. I am. Right? That's really what he's saying. You know the verses. You know when these things happen, your Messiah is here. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is at hand. Your Messiah is here. You think you think about you think about all those things, and of course, like I said, it's easy for us to look back and say, "Man, why did you all not get it?" I mean, could, huh? Oh yeah. That's uh, that's what uh, was it three score year and ten, yeah. right? So that's seventy years, and so that's that's basically you know what's the lifespan? What's the average lifespan of people is about seventy five years old, right? Seventy four or so, seventy two, something like that. And it says what four score? So you're looking at at eighty if you're doing good. 
Well, how many people are like 119 or something like that, you know? Um, but yeah, that's that's a good that's a good point. So I'm thinking that's probably what he was talking about with this back here, right? The four score, the three score, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Ronnie, for that one. Um, go back to Matthew chapter eight real quick. Matthew chapter 8. We talked about this a little bit last week, remember? Um, chapter, chapter 8, verse 20, 28. Matthew eight twenty eight. And when he was come to the other side of the, into the country of the Gergesenes, there, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Now, what's interesting about this, now we've talked about this before, right? So here you've got the nation of Israel should know those five courses of judgment. They should understand what's going on down here during that fifth course, and there's five different parts that's going on there. Um, the 70 weeks, the 60 or the seven weeks, the 62 weeks, that the Messiah is going to be cut off. They should know where they are in the timeline. But what's interesting is, what do we find out about these devils? Amen. They knew the timeline. Now, we kind of talked about this a couple weeks ago. They knew the timeline. Now, if, if, if they knew the timeline of all this that's supposed to be taking place, then that's absolute and total proof if you're not convinced otherwise that the mystery that was kept secret couldn't have been revealed because they would have known it too mystery could not, cannot be found in the Old Testament scriptures or Satan and his angels would have known you better believe they're going to keep an eye out yeah because they knew these devils knew and, and that what he says what and behold they cried out saying what have we to do with thee? What do they call him? Jesus, thou Son of God. They understood who Jesus was. They understood that he was the Son of God. And he also, they also knew that there is a particular time in which he was going to torment them and says, are you coming before the time? That says a lot. That tells you that what Paul is preaching has to be different. Has to be. Because had any of that been previously put out there, they would have known. Right? <clears throat> they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And they knew something about that timeline. Um, notice, notice what happens down here. Keep on going. Uh, let's drop down to, let's drop down to verse thirty-four. What happens to the devils is is Jesus Christ puts them into swine. The swine run down into uh, into the waters and they perish there. Right. Um, notice, notice in verse thirty-three. And they that kept them fled and went their ways in, into the city and told everything. So the people that kept the pigs, the swine, they see the swine run down into the water. And what do they do? They go to the city and tell everything that takes place, what had befallen the possessed of the devils. Notice in verse 34, And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus and said, Praise the Lord, the Messiah is here. Is that what they said? No. When they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. What did they say? Get out of here. Again, we look at this and we say, how does Israel not get it? But then they don't. What's their response? Get out. 
And then we sit here and wonder why people don't show up here. People don't believe. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they kicked him out of the synagogue a lot of times. Yeah. And, and you stop and you think about that stuff and you're like, okay. A lot of that starts making a whole lot more sense when you, when you start seeing these things. Um, notice <clears throat> chapter 9. Verse 1. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. All right? So he returns to Capernaum. All right? His own city. Verse 2. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thought, by the way, underline that. In fact, in verse 3, underline where it says, The scribes said within themselves. And then in verse 4, underline, Jesus knowing their thoughts. What chapter is that again? Chapter 9, verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> they said within themselves, this man blasphemeth, and Jesus knowing their thoughts said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Now you stop and you think about that real quick. You've got, you've got God in the flesh doing what? Knows their thoughts and their heart. Does that remind you of another verse by any chance? Hebrews chapter 4, right? The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder, even the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and what? Knowing the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, we know, you go, over to, you go over to 1 John, you find out that there's three that bear record, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. The Word, that's a capital W. It's the living Word. It is so closely related to this book that the Lord can read your thoughts thoughts and so can this book that's why you don't take this stuff lightly and that's why you don't change it to a different version because God has placed his life in this book um, <clears throat> continue on here Verse, verse 5, he says, For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then say, saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Now stop and think about what's going on. They bring this guy who's sick of the palsy, right? What's he say? He says what? Be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Notice, what's the first thing he does? Does he heal him? First, or does he say your sins are forgiven? He forgives his sins first. Then you notice in, in, in verse, verse 6, uh, at the end there it says, Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. Then he heals him. Right? So he deals with the main issue first, the real need, the forgiveness of sin. Then he deals with the second one. Now, here's what's interesting. Notice in verse 6 there, but, thou, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. 
You know, you stop and you think about that. He's showing them, I am the Messiah. I am the one that can forgive sins, and I'm the one that can heal so that the nation of Israel is completely and utterly without excuse. All they had to do is believe. And what are these things doing? They're validating Him and the message that He's preaching. Right? And we see this. We see this over and over again. <clears throat> now, we get over to chapter 12. And, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of different things that's, that's really interesting as you go through here. Chapter 10, you know, he's got the, where he calls out the 12. Um, chapter chapter 12, let's go over there real quick. Um, chapter 12, what he starts to do is notice in chapter 12, um, notice in chapter 12, verse 14, there, there's, there's a lot of different things here that we start seeing. Um, notice chapter 12, verse 14, then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. Verse 15, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them what? All. All right. Um, you take a look at uh, chapter 14. Go over to chapter 14 real quick. <clears throat> chapter 14. And we'll talk about this in, in the Matthew once we get through there. But uh, chapter 14, verse 14. Uh, notice, 14, 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Chapter 15, verse 30. 15, verse 30. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he what? Healed them. Why? Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. You take a look at those, and that's, that's not all. Um, you look at uh, chapter 19. <clears throat> chapter 19, verse 2. Notice in verse 1, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, He departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea and beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them there. Chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 13, And He said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to Him in the temple, and He healed them. <laughs> you go take a look at all this stuff, and you're just like, over and over and over again, what does He do? He's healing them, and He's healing them, and He's healing them. And what's interesting is, is, each one of these, you go back to go back to Matthew chapter twelve. <clears throat> what's what's interesting is when you take a look at these, especially this in chapter twelve, verse twenty-two, uh, which we didn't look at yet, but I want us to make sure that we see this in in Matthew chapter twelve, verse twenty-two, and we're getting low on time. But there's there's something that I want to make sure that we see, and we'll we'll go back and we'll pick up here next week, uh, I guess, with part three. Yeah, we got a bunch more anyway, so. <clears throat> Part three of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. Notice, there, there's, there's some things here that, that, that the nation of Israel should have been able to have seen, right? We, we, again, hindsight being, being what it is, we can see this. Um, notice, Ma uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. All right. 
Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him. Now, what happens here is you've got a picture of the nation of Israel with this guy right here. He's possessed with the devil. He's blind and dumb. Okay? In so much the... Um, and he healed them in so much that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. Notice in verse 23. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Close, right? Well, he is a son of David because they, they realize that. But who is he really? He's oh, the he's son of God, right? The son of man. We already looked at those verses. Verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Now, you stop and you think about that. What's their, what's their response there? He's, just a devil. He's doing this by Satan's power, Beelzebub, not by, not by God's power. And Jesus knew their thoughts. Again, there it is again. And he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city of or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? It's a good question, right? And so that's what he brings up. But what do their leaders do? They're saying, He's not doing this by the power of God, he's doing this by Satan. And so then that's why he brings up, he's like, How can Satan cast out Satan? That's a, good, that's a good question. But that's what they're doing, right? Now, <clears throat> what happens is not everybody follows him, right? So what is it that they're, what is it that they're really trusting in? That the men and their traditions and what these men say or the Word of God. They're following the men and the traditions, right? Which is why we look at that and we say, that's why Israel missed every bit of it. We can fall into the trap of following people, which we've said here before, don't ever follow us. Me or Delilah, don't follow me. Get in the book and study the things out for yourself. It's possible, but but here here's the thing though. They knew this, right? Well, we they they knew the timeline, but here's the difference. Is there a timeline for the dispensation of the grace of God? No. There's not. Right? So then there's other things too we've talked about before. But <clears throat> when we talk about when we talk about these things that are going on, they knew them. They knew the timeline. And there is no timeline for the dispensation of grace. But what do we know? The fact that we're alive today means there's one more day of grace for us to be able to go and do what we're supposed to do. Um, but that's. You stick to what you know. But you stick people to what you stick know. To what they know. Mm -hmm. And people today who are saved often don't stick to what they know. They move on to other well, things. Well, oftentimes it's not even they, they stick to what they know, is they don't know much. Mm -hmm. not sticking to what they know. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. They had they knew what they did. I see what you're saying now, yeah. And when the time came, when Jesus Christ came, they just they didn't believe it. Yeah. I see they what didn't you're saying stick now. To what they knew. Yeah, I see right. what you're saying now. Yeah. And, and so I would agree with that. I think that's just a human nature thing. It's it's part of it, yeah. It's simple, part of it. Simple nature. It's and it's the the lack. Important to stick to this. Yeah. What it says. Yeah, and it's a lack of long suffering is yeah. what it is. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and the only way that you can suffer long is through Scripture working in and through you by believing the verses. Mm -hmm. Don't move away from it. Mm -hmm. Which is a lot of people do. And sometimes it's because they don't know. But yeah, sometimes they should know. Again, they should know, right? We should know too. I mean, you know, for instance, you take the, the judgment seat of Christ thing just here recently. You should know that Timothy was part of the, the, the body of Christ, not the little flock. We should know that. That is that is basic information that we should know. It could be a good study. Like, you should know. Israelites coming out of Egypt. What's the first thing they did? They made when, when mm -hmm. the, before the Ten Commandments. Well, Moses came down and... Or, mm -hmm. Moses. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Yeah. Abraham built the ark, and Moses. Okay, yeah. no. <laughs> and uh, you know they're they're carrying on. They didn't even stand true to what they just witnessed and were a part of. Yeah. You should know. Mm -hmm. There's all these instances of where you should know this is God's word present to you. Mm -hmm. And what does man always do? More than likely. Yeah. Go the other way. Yeah. And, and that's, that's an important key for all of us to, to, to keep in mind. Like I said, you know, we should know those things. We should know that when Paul writes, he's writing to saved members of the body of Christ. Um, so he's not talking to the little flock. In fact, when, when we take, because all the time everybody says, we don't mix law and grace, but all of a sudden you've got people teaching and people believing that Paul mixed law and grace. So you know that, but you you don't do that. And it's the same thing here. They they knew these things, but sometimes you forget about things that you that you should know. Side note, when people say Paul didn't say a whole lot about hell, y'all are talking to saved individuals. Mm -hmm. Why would you talk a lot about a place where saved even individuals are not going to go? Yeah, no, exactly right. That's exactly right. <clears throat> um and that's, that's one of those things. Real quick, let's go get one of the things. I want to show you this. Go get uh, Jeremiah chapter 30. And uh, we'll, we'll see this. We'll see this real quick. And this will go along with what we're talking about here. Um, because this is what happens, right? Jeremiah chapter 30. If nothing else, this is something that the nation of Israel should have known. Right? Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith who? The Lord. The Lord. So when, when Jesus shows up and He's healing them, they should know what? He is who He says He is. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. What's He looked at as? An outcast. You trust what I say. Don't go study for yourself. Just come to me and I'll tell you what you need to know. I'm the final authority is what these leaders were doing. And so often people don't study the scriptures for themselves to find out for themselves. They trust some guy to stand up and say, I've got, I've got a degree from some place. I know more than you do. So if you want to know stuff, come ask me and I'll tell you what you need to know. Because that's easier. Because it's easier and people are lazy. So Absolutely. It's hard. Yeah. Well, Scripture tells us study is a weariness to the flesh. And that's why a lot of us don't do it. Uh, is because it takes time. It takes time away from meme sharing. And it takes time away from, you know, praise and worship bands. And it takes time away from all this other stuff. And it's just, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing to do. Uh, but what we see here is that's the response. They should have been able to have thought... When they saw Jesus Christ doing this, they should have thought, Jeremiah 30, 17, that's the answer. But they didn't. And, no, it's because they didn't want to, yeah. 
And it comes from a lack of knowledge. And God says what? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And that's exactly what's going on today is personal Bible st- personal daily Bible study is is not part of it. Now, um, <clears throat> we'll continue on with with this next time, and um, we'll see how far we get uh, dealing with the the ministry of Jesus Christ, the the healing ministry and the casting out of the devil's ministry that he had, and um, we'll pick back up there. next week. All right. Questions, comments, concerns.